Hello everyone. Today we have another important guest. He is a philosopher, he is a scientist, and he has a very interesting book as well. So he's from UK, and most importantly, his book, uh, uh, like many, many big universities, they follow and they do research on his book. Uh, from like let's say example Oxford University, Cambridge University, MIT and many big universities actually following his book, book and he's a very big scientist and philosopher. He has a lot of contributions uh, in global arena. So hello Mr. Anthony, how are you? Greetings, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, very good. So can you please introduce yourself about yes. your activities? Yes, I, I, shall, I shall add to your uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'm a philosopher and a science fiction and a science, science writer, essentially, and uh, a theistic evolutionist. And so today I'll be introducing some of my concepts in terms of uh, theistic evolution and why the whole notion of God is so important to science. Uh, we are led to believe that uh, science and God are diametrically opposed. You have to believe in one or the other. But actually, they can work together symbiotically. In fact, theology, philosophy and science can work together as one, uh, if you like, as, as a trinity in a sense. They become one in essence and they, they, they live together symbiotically. And this is a very important concept which I uh, speak about a lot in my work. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. So, so you, I, I know you are a debater and you, you have a strong argument okay, on metaphysics and you are a believer as well and this is very interesting for us. That's it. As I said, uh, I write a lot about I write a lot about artificial intelligence, um, mm. the universe, ma uh, terraforming Mars, and so forth. But today, obviously, I'm going to concentrate, gravitate to one around one essential point, which is science and theology. As I said, how philosophy, science, and theology can can actually work as one. So you don't have three, but in essence, you have one giant universal orb of thought, where science, philosophy, and theology sit together symbiotically. And you have one giant universal orb of thought, and they're one, and they work together. So they're not diametrically opposed, as many scientists uh, are led to to say, like Richard Dawkins and so forth. Very interesting. So, yes, uh, yeah. like like uh, we uh, we want to know about all, all of your arguments and how you start well, your analysis. Yeah, we want to obviously, know. Obviously, obviously, this obviously this is a very extensive thing in the sense that it's extremely multidimensional. There are so many key points. So I will just briefly touch on certain things. Now, the first thing I want to touch on is what is man? Well, man is essentially a bundle of particles, okay? We're a bundle of particles, but we are made up of a neutron. Essentially, we're made up of a neutron. We're made up of many particles, but the particle that we are made up of predominantly is a neutron. Now, the interesting thing about a neutron is this, that a neutron is not only radioactive, but it also decays within 10 minutes. So the interesting thing here is, what gives? How is it that we are here if we are made up of something that is A, radioactive, and B, decays within 10 minutes? Incidentally, this is known as weak decay. This is known as weak decay because within the world of particle physics, within particle physics units, uh, 10 minutes is actually a very long time. So it's known as weak decay. So 10 minutes within the world of particle physics, part of particle physics units, 10 minutes is a very, very long time. But within our world, our classical world, 10 minutes is a very short time. So here you actually have the relativity, the relativity of time at play. Not to mention that when a neutron decays, once a neutron decays, becomes unstable, and in quotes dies, it come, it, its energy is never lost because of the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. Because of the first law of thermodynamics, uh, its energy is never lost, even though it becomes unstable and decays. So it becomes a proton, electron, and a neutrino. So you have the first law of thermodynamics there, proton, electron, and neutrino. So once a, a neutron decays, it becomes a proton, electron, and a neutrino. So going back to my original point, how is it that we exist if we are made up of something that is A, radioactive, and B, decays so quickly? Well, the interesting thing here is this. An atheist will say this is an accident. I say this is orchestrated because it's far too complex. Once you place a neutron into a nucleus, it becomes bound. In, in other words, it requires energy to release itself from. It becomes bound in the nucleus. As it, lose, as, as it becomes bound, it loses energy. So it becomes bound, it loses energy. So if we apply E equals mc squared, 
If we apply E equals MC squared, we know that if it loses energy, it will also lose mass. It loses so much mass that it stabilizes within the nucleus. And it can no longer decay into a pro, uh, an electron, proton, plus uh, neutrino. Now, this is an incredible thing. And we exist because of this process. In fact, all the heavy elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and iron, all those nuclei exist because of this. Everything exists because of this process. That once you place a neutron into a nucleus, it becomes bound, it loses energy, E equals MC squared, so it loses energy, it also loses mass. It loses so, ma so much mass that it can no longer decay into a proton, electron, and a neutrino. And so it doesn't decay. And that's the reason why we are here. Mm -hmm. Now, my argument is this. An atheist will say this is nothing but an accident, just a, a complete accident of nature. I say this is far too complex to be an accident. This is, to me, orchestrated. There's thought process in this because it's far too complex. It's the same. In fact, uh, many people will say, well, OK, fine. But who created God? Well, that's an oxymoron. By definition, God is an eternal being that transcends time and space. Incidentally, time and space is an electromagnetic field. It's zero point electromagnetic quanta. It's an electromagnetic field. We who are bound by time and space, past, present and future, that live in a Trinitarian perception of reality, do not perceive something that is eternal in nature. But God dwells outside the sphere of time and space, and he is the mechanism involved with what I've just explained. Otherwise, to say that this is just an accident is, for me, impossible. It's far too complex. It's far too complex. The whole thing about the neutron, as I have described to you, is orchestrated by a, a, power, uh, by a, a higher power, by, an, by a, a, a mechanism. And this mechanism is an infinite, eternal being that exist independent of both time and space. So that's my first point. In fact, to elaborate on this, I could say that this is essentially order out of chaos. Through chaos, God establishes order. Through chaos, God establishes order. In fact, we see this with the Big Bang. In fact, we see this with the formation of molecules. Let me explain. How does life arise? Life arises as a result of an imperfection at an atomic level. The stable atom, the stable atom doesn't do anything. It's the atom that lacks an electron. It's the atom that lacks an electron, the needy abnormal atom that seeks to merge with other atoms, forming covalent bonds, DNA, RNA, and then life starts as a result of an imperfection at an atomic level, order out of chaos. Incidentally, this proves that the whole concept of perfection is nothing but a construct of the mind. The whole concept of perfection is nothing but a construct of the mind because it's the atom that lacks an electron, the abnormal atom, the atom that is needy, that says, wait a second, I need atomic equilibrium. I need balance here. It then binds to other atoms to make up for that missing electron. And through this process, we have in physics covalent bonds, RNA, DNA, and so forth, that then produce, molecules are produced, and then life and the evolutionary process begins with a deficiency at an atomic level. Life starts at an at a order out of chaos, essentially. So this is the first point I'd like to make, and it's a very interesting point. My next point uh, is actually this. What is the universe? Well, I'm going to break this down into two. The first part of this is uh, basically that the universe, coming from a cosmological perspective here, is actually a trinity. What do I mean? The universe is a space-time matter continuum. The universe is actually three and one. It's a space-time matter continuum. It's a trinitarian perception of the universe. If we break these down, if we break these down, let's take, for example, time. What is time? Time is past, present, and potential future, because the future only exists as a potential. Past, present, and potential future, the future only exists as a potential. Within the three segments of time, it represents the totality of time. You have a Trinitarian perception of reality. In fact, man's oscillating consciousness is integrated within three perceptions of time, past, present, and potential future. That represents the totality of time. We live in a Trinitarian perception of reality. Our oscillating consciousness exists within this Trinitarian perception of reality. Our soul, 
which is our mind, will, and emotions, is a nexus of electromagnetic forces that cannot be destroyed because of the first law of thermodynamics. Our soul is integrated within this Trinitarian perception of reality. There's a trinity within time itself. Space, barring, the, barring uh, time, space is three-dimensional. And within each dimension of space, it permeates all of space. Trinitarian perception of space. And matter, and when I say matter, light and sound, matter, light and sound, is the unseen, omnipresent energy that manifests itself in various forms of measurable motion corresponding with natural phenomena. Light produces light energy that produces the light that is seen. Light produces light energy that produces the light that is seen, and the same mathematical formula for sound. We live in a Trinitarian universe. Space, time, and matter, as I've said. Space, the three dimensions of space, time, past, present, and potential future, and obviously light and matter, as I've just described now to you. So it's a very interesting concept. Now, B, is the universe a mechanical universe or a dynamic universe? The universe, as Isaac Newton was led to believe, is actually a mechanical universe. It's a mechanistic universe. A mechanistic universe requires a mechanism. We can see how it's evolving and so forth. This is not a dynamic universe. A dynamic universe is a living system. It gathers information as it goes along. And so you get a basically random evolution. It becomes unpredictable, non-linear pattern. Yep. And dynamic processes, sorry, dynamic processes are systems with information feedback operations, i.e. a fractal. But we don't have this picture of the universe. We don't have a dynamic universe. We have a mechanistic universe. So a mechanical universe requires a mechanism. Again, this again, proving that there has to be a greater being that transcends time and space, infinite in both time and space. As I said, space and time is an electromagnetic field, zero point electromagnetic quanta. And we are bound by time and space. Therefore, we cannot perceive something that is beyond time and space. To perceive God is something beyond us because God is eternal. We are beings that have a past, present and future that live within a Trinitarian perception of reality. OK, excuse me. Right. My next point is this. What was responsible? What was responsible for pumping energy into the open system, the universe in the very beginning? First law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. Energy cannot be destroyed, but will transform from one form into another and so forth. What was responsible for pumping energy into the into the open system? Again, this mechanism, this infinite being that transcends time and space. Right. My next point is this. And I'm going to sort of do a little bit of a jump here, but <laughs> bear with me. Uh, sorry, I've got so, you know what it is. I've got so much to share. I've had to make certain points and I'm sort of gravitating, but my mind is exploding with ideas. So I'm trying to sort of narrow it down and give little bits without going overboard. Right. There are two kinds of things. There are things that exist necessarily. Excuse me. And there are things that exist contingently. Things that exist necessarily exist out of the necessity of their own nature. <laughs> In other words, they have to exist. Okay? Things that exist necessarily have to exist. They exist out of the necessity of their own nature. What do I mean? Mathematical objects exist in this way. The number five exists in this way. Numbers exist in this way. Abstract things like this, the number four, the number three, exist in this way. They exist necessarily out of the necessity of their own nature. But things that exist contingently, by contrast, don't exist necessarily. They exist because something has caused them to exist, i.e., man, animals, the universe. Now, a clever atheist will come along and say this. Actually, we don't need that. You know why? The universe is eternal. We have an eternal universe, the eternity of matter theory. Most pantheists believe in the eternity of matter theory. In other words, we don't need to explain the universe because the universe has always existed. Therefore, we don't need God. We don't need an eternal being. The universe is eternal, it's always existed. Thus, we can push God aside, no need for God. But does this work? A, there is no mathematics to actually back this uh, concept of the eternity of matter theory. Not to mention that there are four things that can dismantle this argument very quickly. The first is this, if the universe was eternal, it would have reached a point where all usable energy was exhausted. We don't have a picture. We don't have that picture. The universe is full of cosmic energy. So if the universe was eternal, it would have reached a point where all usable energy was exhausted. But it's not like that. It's full of cosmic energy. 
The second one is this, background cosmic radiation. Background cosmic radiation. Heat remnants left over from the Big Bang, which we have detected in the universe. We know that an explosion took place. Relativity, the third point, we know that the universe is expanding as a result of dark energy. 70% of the universe is predominantly dark energy, and this and our universe is expanding, which implies that the universe at one point was a cluster. It had a point genesis. It's not eternal, not at all. Now, the most beautiful point is this, the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, the immutable metaphysical law of the universe. Entropy means erosion and decay. Death is a manifestation of this law. It's the immutable metaphysical, metaphysical law of the universe. Do we see entropy at play within the cosmos? Yes, we do. Take a star. A star will succumb to gravitational collapse as its elements grow heavy and lose energy and eventually die. And then it distorts the fabric of time and space in the form of a black hole. So we see stellar death within the cosmos. As I said, star will lose energy. Its elements will grow heavy, eventually it will decay and decay and decay, and eventually distort in the fabric of time and space in the form of a black hole, singularity and so forth. That's another topic. There is death within the cosmos, which implies there's a point genesis to the universe. So the eternality of matter, the eternity of matter theory, is very easily dismissed and is, is left for science fiction books, which I write many about. Many stories are about this, but it's nothing but science fiction. The universe had a point genesis. And these four arguments destroy this argument completely. Mm -hmm. Right. My next point is something from nothing. Richard Dawkins mm -hmm. and the Lawrence Krauss discussed this extensively. Something from nothing. Now, what do I mean? Well, due to the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity, we now know that empty space is actually not empty. That mm -hmm. every single point in space actually contains information. I repeat, every single point in space contains information. The universe is a giant cosmic superconductor. There's an invisible field everywhere in the universe. We know this through the Hydrogen Collider. I accept that, no problem. So basically what we have is virtual particles, virtual particles, a bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence within space. Every point in space contains information. So empty space is not empty. Virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence perpetually, continually, within the quantum world. Empty space is not empty. Virtual particles popping in and out of existence perpetually. This can only happen within the quantum world, by the way. It couldn't happen within a classical world, our world, because it would violate the laws of energy. You can't produce mass. We didn't have mass in the first place. So this is only reserved for the quantum world. So what a... What a uh, a physicist or a scientist like Richard Dawkins would say, because of this, if you wait long enough, you are guaranteed by the laws of quantum mechanics alone to produce something from seemingly, seemingly in quotes, because empty space is not empty, you are bound to produce something from seemingly nothing, i.e. particles and matter. Because gravity allows, sorry, <coughs> gravity allows negative and energy and positive energy configurations, okay? Right. In fact, in fact, once you apply the laws of quantum mechanics to gravity itself, space itself becomes a quantum mechanical variable and literally fluctuates in and out of existence. And so just via the laws of quantum mechanics themselves, you can literally produce universes, spaces and times where there was no space and time before. But there's a problem here, Richard Dawkins. Laws do not create matter. The laws of quantum mechanics cannot create matter. Laws do not create matter. If you're saying that the laws of quantum mechanics over time create matter, you're ascribing creative power to laws. Physical laws do not create physical realities. When we look at a cell, take a cell. A cell operates under certain laws. Okay, DNA, RNA, and so forth. Okay, but those laws that govern that cell didn't bring the cell into existence. So we need to separate agency, sorry, we need to separate agency from this whole notion of uh, 
shall we say, uh, a cell being created by a law, by laws. Laws do not create physical realities. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important point. Laws do not create physical reality. So there's a problem here mm -hmm. for atheists. The laws of quantum, the laws of quantum mechanics alone cannot create physical realities, my friend. Mm -hmm. No laws mm -hmm. can. Laws only describe how certain things work under certain conditions. Mm -hmm. As I said, you take a cell, a cell operates under certain laws, but those laws were not responsible for bringing the cell into existence. Laws are one thing, agency is another. Laws are one thing, agency is another. The question is, who created those laws? That's the key. Mm -hmm. Only God, that is infinite in both time and space, could have ordained those laws, could have created those laws. In fact, our universe operates under certain mathematical laws. Nature oper operates under mathematics. So an atheist is basically saying that these mathematical laws are nothing but a coincidence. No. They, these laws were inscribed, and it takes a mind to have formulated them for the universe to operate as it does. So there we have it, my friend. My next, uh, my next point is entropy and evolution. Back to entropy. Entropy is the second law of thermodynamics. Sorry. Entropy is the second law of thermodynamics. As I said, it's the immutable metaphysical law of the universe. Everything over time decays. Everything over time decays. Proteins, molecules, and so forth. Death is a manifestation of this law. So how could proteins and molecules have become far more complex over time in light of what we know about the second law of thermodynamics that tells us actually it's the inverse. Over time, things become corrupted and disintegrate and die. Many scientists will use the open system uh, notion as a way out of this. But to me, there is no way out of this. The fact of the matter is, if proteins and molecules are becoming far more complex over time, there has to be a force that governs. There has to be an energy. There has to be a mind that is doing this process. In other words, evolution only works theistically. To say that this universe started via evolution, atheistically, is saying that proteins and molecules over time become far more complex and then suddenly life appears. But that's impossible because entropy tells us the inverse. Over time, things die. So how could things become more complex over time? You need a mechanism. God is this eternal mechanism. He is the mechanism be uh, behind the mechanical universe. He is the mechanism be behind evolution. You need God. This is why I said science and God and theology work together symbiotically. Instead of having three, you have one giant universal orb of thought, and God controls all the mechanisms of life. Now, I'm saying this from a non-religious point of view. I'm just saying that God is the great architect, the great mind behind evolution, behind the mechanical universe, because otherwise we have a problem. We have a mechanical universe. We don't have a dynamic universe, as I've mentioned before. Not to mention, as I've said, entropy tells us that over time things become corrupted and over time things disintegrate and die. Proteins and molecules over time die and disintegrate. But we don't have that. Through evolution, we have the inverse. So how could evolution work? You need a mechanism for this process to continue. And that's why we're here, because God is working through evolution as he's working through the mechanical universe. Okay. My next point is this. <clears throat> Our planet is approximately four and a half billion years old. Mm -hmm. Approximately four and a half billion years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. After about half a billion years, excuse me, <clears throat> we had the first formation of life, shall we say. We had uh, bacteria and microorganisms after about half a billion years. Yeah. So uh, that's pretty much what happened. After that, then things became far more complex, bigger and more interesting. Now, my point here is this, and I want to be very brief here, is this. Within evolution, we transition from physics to biology and then to chemistry. But I'm going to sit at biology. Once we reach biology, biological processes, as I mentioned, we had microorganisms and bacteria. We transition from biology to chemistry. We have this sudden quantum leap from biology to chemistry. Biological processes to chemical processes. But no atheistic evolutionist, including Richard Dawkins himself, can explain this sudden transition. 
He doesn't know because, incidentally, as a result of this quantum leap, if you like, in quotes, we had the formation of genetics. Mm -hmm. Genetics started as a result of this sudden transition from biological processes to chemical processes, okay? And then we had the formation of genetics, the first high-tech genetic molecule, a precursor to DNA. And then suddenly, life. He calls this a gap. This is not a gap. This is a colossal gap. You know why? If you can't explain how genetics started, you can't explain evolution because evolution sits on the pillar of genetics. Evolution sits on the pillar of genetics. So if you can't explain how we went from biological processes to chemical processes, okay, this sudden transition and then the formation of the high-tech genetic molecule, as I've mentioned, yep, and then DNA, if you can't explain that, you can't really explain genetics. Sorry, you can't really explain evolution because all of evolution sits on the pillar of genetics. He says this is a missing gap that we're trying to fill, but he can't fill it because the only thing that can fill it is a divine spark. A divine spark is the only thing can fill that transition, i.e. what created genetics was this eternal infinite being that transcends time and space exists outside of the sphere of time and space, independent of both time and space. As I said, space and time is an electromagnetic field, zero point electromagnetic quanta. It's an electromagnetic field. God dwells in eternality. He is the spark in that gap to explain how genetics started. Richard Dawkins says this is a gap. We don't know how it started, which we're working on it. We're going to find out one day, hopefully. They're never going to find out because of his atheistic attack. He doesn't want to admit that there is something far too complex here for him to deal with. The fact of the matter is we transition from biology to chemistry. Then we get genetics. Evolution sits on genetics, the pillar of genetics. If you can't explain how genetics started, you really can't explain evolution. God is the mechanism behind genetics. He is the gap that fills that gap that he says is a gap. And all life started with this eternal being that transcends time and space. Evolution needs God. The mechanical universe needs God, as I've explained through entropy, the first law of thermodynamics, and so forth. Right. I'll end with this last point here. The reason why people struggle with the whole concept of God, as I have said, is because they're bound by time and space. They're bound by time, as I've already explained. We live in a Trinitarian perception of reality. We live in past present and potential future because the future only exists as a potential we live in this trinitarian perception of reality okay we are bound by time so we live in these three se different segments of time past present and potential future and beyond that we cannot perceive something that is actually eternal in nature so the problem is something within the nature of man we don't have the cognitive faculties to understand something that dwells in eternality it's something that transcends time and space. It's something beyond the mind. Yet at the same time, we have the ability within our intelligence to understand that we could not have come here, as I've discussed, from just a, a mindless explosion. As I've destroyed the eternality of matter theory, as I've told you, that's impossible. So you just have to say this is just a mindless explosion and suddenly we're here. No, it couldn't be. There has to be a mechanism at work. There has to be. In fact, epistemology in, in, in philosophy is all to do with knowledge. Where does all this knowledge come from? It all stems from the eternal source. If you remove this infinite being, if you remove him from the equation, even knowledge, everything collapses, including knowledge and so forth. All things, including knowledge, stem from the eternal source who dwells outside of time and space. I'll leave it with you. Thank you for your nice discussions and a very good debatable strategy. But I have uh, some uh, some perceptions and I, I just want to know and there are very good audience. I will come to the audience response as well. First thing first, you are discussing about uh, uh, like uh, present uh, the world, uh, uh, how the world is running and how it works and how God has relationship with every aspect of this world. My first thing is that there are many philosophers like you, but those who are not believers. My first point is that why you become believers? 
My second point is that at present we are in challenging situations with COVID-19 pandemic and many more things. How you want to explain at present particular situations with your uh, analysis of God, why these things happen? Right, right, okay. Firstly, it's very important that I mention this. The sheer fact that there is suffering in the world doesn't dis disprove God's existence. It just means you have to change your philosophy, your theology, your understanding, excuse me, of the universe. People use suffering to say, well, we all suffer. There's terrible things happening within the universe. We're sorry, within our planet. Terrible things happening on our planet every single day. God couldn't exist. Suffering does not disprove God's existence. Even if you have to come to the analogy, the point to say, well, God is evil. So be it. But it doesn't disprove this mechanism, God exists, whether he's good or evil or both, you know, dualism. What I'm trying to say is suffering does not disprove his existence. It just means we have to understand things a little bit clearer, a little bit more clearer. For example, the whole notion of evil. Evil doesn't exist outside of man. Let me explain. What is evil? Is uh, a lightning storm evil? No, it's an atmospheric discharge. When a snake bites, is that evil? No, it's, it's a defense mechanism. The same with a shark and so forth. An earthquake is to do with tectonic activity, seismic shifts, releasing of energy and so forth. All these natural things that we call natural disasters. It's just nature. It's not evil. There's no evil involved. The only thing that is evil is what lies within the soul of man as a potential thing. Evil only exists within the soul of man as an acting potential. Within the reptilian complex, there's a region of the brain known as the reptilian complex. I know... Hello, Mr. Anthony. Uh, uh, dear audience, I think Mr. Anthony has uh, some of the issues with internet. So uh, hopefully soon he's gonna come up with his analysis. Uh, and he will he will he will analyze all of the things in a professional way and uh, uh, most important point uh, uh, point of uh, view is that uh, mr anthony actually trying to explain the, uh, pre uh, the existence of gods and uh, uh, by which we can analyze the our present situations by which we can understand uh, that how we can uh, sustain in this world uh, Mr. Anthony, uh, can you can you join with us? Yeah, no, the, the, the Wi-Fi has just gone down. I've just removed it. Okay, so uh, dear audience, I already discussed with Mr. Anthony and uh, uh, he is actually uh, facing some problems and issue with internet connections. He will come back soon. And by this time, we, based on his discussions, like how uh, a different audience come with their questions, you can ask questions. So when he join with us, uh, I'm going to ask him questions about this uh, metaph metaphysics and existence of gods and uh, biological uh, economy and, and uh, more interesting things. And uh, yes, Mr. Anthony. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Anthony has a few of the issue with the internet connection. So he is solving his internet connections and he's uh, joining with us. And uh, he has actually a lot of contributions in, uh, in metaphysics sectors and his books he has a many many interesting books all of his books now uh, the student from oxford university student from cambridge university student from mit and the many more many many big universities they are following his concept even he attended in, in different different debatings and many more activities so uh, already yes yes already Hello. yes already mr anthony joining with us can you hear me mr anthony i can i can sir as I was saying, yes. you were talking about the whole notion of suffering. As I said, suffering does not disprove the existence of an eternal creator, even if you have to come to the conclusion that the creator is not of good nature. It doesn't disprove that God is the mechanism behind evolution, the, mecha the mechanical universe, and the universe as we know it. It doesn't disprove that at all. 
even if you have to come to that point. The point that I was saying to you is this, the whole notion of evil, evil does not exist outside of man. As I said, natural disasters like earthquakes and so forth is to do with tectonic activity, seismic shifts and so forth, going into geophysics and geology and so on, yeah? Seismic shifts, st raising stress, the same with uh, thunder and lightning, atmospheric discharges. These are natural things, they have to occur. A shark is an evil when it goes to eat, that's all it knows, it's a predator. Same with the snake and so forth. So outside of man, there is no such thing as evil. These are just... I think uh, Mr. Anthony has the same issues again. So uh, he need to, he need to solve these things. This is very interesting discussions. I do not want to miss his interesting discussions and definitely he gonna solve his internet related problem and he will come back soon. So uh, sorry about sorry about the internet problems. So I think that uh, Mr. Anthony actually facing uh, some of the internet related problems from his sides, and definitely he gonna come back again. Yes, can you please join me? Okay. So uh, we are communicating, uh, my teams and I am also communicating with him in between one and two minutes, he's going to join with us. So what I'm discussing about uh, uh, about some of his contributions, so... So, you know, at the present situations, he live in UK. So in UK, uh, he ha he facing some of the challenge and problem with Internet and uh, other things. So hopefully, hopefully uh, he's going to solve this thing soon and he, he will join with us. So um, basically, uh, I, I just want to share some of the uh, uh, his biography and some of his inter uh, in, uh, international contributions. Specifically, he born in England in 1975. And he's a philosopher and science fiction writer's author uh, on quantum chrono, uh, chronics uh, and quantum chron uh, chronics too, Imperial Planet, Silent Earth, and the Mars Time Project. His book deal primarily with philosophy, science, artificial intelligence, and theology. And uh, Anthony books are held at various universities, such as, such as Oxford University, Imperial College London, and highly regarded by some of the world leading scientists. So um, this is this is this is actually a, a very interesting discussions when even personally I attend in Oxford Union and in the Cambridge Union, you know, Thursday night they have a debate. Uh, they have a debate on existence of God and many interesting topic. So um, this kind of discussions actually help us to understand how we have to play in that present situations and how we can play and may, uh, solve these issues in the present situations. Even uh, there are a lot more confusions in the present science and the present uh, uh, situations. And uh, and we have to we have to solve these specific issues. And when we ha we are a scientific believers. When, when we are uh, 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 real believers of the God and with a proper knowledge and with a proper analysis, that time we can solve uh, our all of the problem. Even in present pandemic situations, we believe that uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, things we cannot um, solve by ourselves. Uh, there are existence of God and God will solve these specific problems. And if we can solve this problem, then Example, we can uh, uh, make our life uh, more perfect. We can survive more effectively. And uh, dear audience, you can wait uh, for this, uh, our honorable speakers, and you will come back soon. So we are trying to communicate with him. Uh, so definitely he's going to join with us. And uh, he's going to discuss with the, all of the specific issues about the God and about the, uh, his analysis and everything. 
Hello. Sorry. I'm sorry about the Wi-Fi. Yes, uh, can you with me? Yes. Yes. Can you please explain some of the issues because audience are observing your show and uh, there are yes. some sort of uh, interruption for your internet connection. Sorry about yes. your Unfortun audience. Unfortunately, sorry. unfortunately, with all my brilliance, that's beyond my power. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, just, I, I just want to know. As, like, as I, just let me finish this point. As I said, evil only exists within the within the soul of man as an acting potential. Hear me out. Evil only exists within the soul of man as an acting potential within the reptilian complex. Within the reptilian complex is a region of the brain. When you have too much activity, electrical and chemical activity within that region of the brain, it brings out the worst in man. And then they do evil acts. But outside of man, there's no such thing as evil, as I have mm. described to you. Mm. This is just nature taking its course, mm -hmm. as I have mentioned. Please go ahead. Mm. I, I, I just want to know about your book, uh, because I know that your book. Well, I've, I've, written, I've written six books. So mm -hmm. which one? Uh, you can you can describe like uh, uh, any of your present uh, books and uh, right. uh, most importantly, yeah. I want to know the relations in between your books and Oxford University and MIT and the Cambridge yeah. Imperial College. How they use your books? How the they yeah. do yeah. research? Yeah. On your book. Okay, yeah. Well, basically, um, even though I'm a science fiction writer, as I said, I I do write hard science fiction. One of my books was the Mars Time Project, for example. In that particular book, I write extensively about terraforming Mars, colonizing Mars, the science involved, and so forth. And um, that's just one particular book. That's a novella, which I published actually last year. Um, some of my other work deals with robotics, artificial intelligence. I deal with uh, the whole notion of AI. In fact, my last book that I published a few months ago is called Androids and the Gods. In quotes, do androids dream of the gods? And within the book, what I have is robots, androids, that start to de develop the um, theological concepts about God. How can a robot develop a sense of God? So what I write about within this book if, is this, that if a machine, a robot, can somehow develop in itself a sense of God, we have to redefine metaphysics. We have to re redefine the nature of the mind. We have to redefine everything, in fact, even the nature of God. So do androids dream of the gods, androids and the gods? So if a machine can somehow develop within itself an understanding of who God is, that God exists, we have to redefine metaphysics. We have to redefine the nature of the mind. And then we create a new philosophy completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if yeah, a robot I, can develop in itself a sense of God, we have to re we have to we have to change everything in terms of what is man, redefine metaphysics, mm -hmm. redefine the nature of the mind, and so forth. In fact, interestingly, with AI, the cells within the nervous system, the cells within the nervous system are the closest things in the universe to the transistors and gates of a computer. So there's an incredible thing here. Obviously, the human brain operates on uh, neurons, a symbiotic connection of neurons, and a machine operates on mathematical algorithms, bits of programming logic that govern the mathematical pathways of a robotic mind. But there's an incredible uh, parallel there. As I said, the closest thing in the universe, as I mentioned, the cells within the nervous system, within a human being, the cells in the nervous system are the closest thing in the universe to the transistors and gates of a computer. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay. I write a lot about that okay. as well. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, there are very interesting uh, 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 sessions uh, about your metaphysics and uh, how things is moving. Let's say I'm a Muslim. I'm a practicing Muslim. So I know that you have a knowledge on Sufi al Bukhari. You have a knowledge on Qurans, and uh, you have you know uh, many interesting things about Islam. So how do you want to define Islam and how do you want to uh, uh, make a relations in between this Sohi al Bukhari and uh, all of the all of your analysis, even present science and technology and improvements? Okay. Well, what I will say, what I will say is this, and I'll start with a very good. I'll start with a magnificent compliment, actually, about Islamic culture. Um, uh, firstly, um, is this 
I will say this, uh, the, the Islamic world, the Muslim world, I mean, I lived in Qatar, Doha, for example, and the generosity uh, that, I, that, I, uh, that I had there was second to none. Not to mention that they built the first library in Cordoba, in Andalusia, you know, mm. during the Moors and the Crusades, when Spain mm. was under the Islamic empire. Yeah? Mm. And so actually um, the Middle East, the Arab world has actually contributed magnificently to science but we're going back some time. So they, uh, they were, if you like, uh, back in the time, they, were, they, they contributed magnificently to algebra, as we know, algebra and so forth. For me to now start to intercombine, because I think you're asking me now to intercombine my knowledge of science and philosophy and metaphysics and so forth with uh, uh, Islam, I'm not in the position to do so, I'm going to be honest, because I don't know enough about Islam to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I do know is, as I said, I have researched a little bit about Sahih al Bukhari, Sahih Muslim al Tabari. I am aware of the hadiths, the narrations, mm -hmm. and so forth. I know a little bit about the Quran, Islamic culture, and so forth. So, for me to give you a concise, precise answer, I would have to know a little bit more about Islam. I don't know enough about Islam to give you that answer. All I know is this, irrespective of any religion, God exists. He is eternal. He is the mechanism behind quantum mechanics, as I told you. He is the mechanism behind the mechanical universe, as I told you. He is the mechanism behind uh, evolution because of entropy, as I told you. Over time, things become less complex and disintegrate. Proteins and molecules over time decay and die. They don't become more complex. But evolution says that over time, Proteins and molecules became far more complex and suddenly life came into being. But we couldn't have that because entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, tells us the inverse, that over time all things become corrupted, most systems become corrupted, and things decay and die. So how could evolution be? It requires a mechanism. God is this mechanism. Whoever he is, God is this mechanism behind evolution, behind the mechanical universe, behind quantum mechanics, as I told you. The, the, before, um, scientists, uh, sorry, the um, Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss, they'll tell you, hey, look, you know, the laws of quantum mechanics over time, just based on the laws of quantum mechanics, you can produce something out of seemingly nothing. But that's impossible because laws, laws do not create physical realities. Laws only describe how certain things work under certain conditions. They don't create physical realities. You need something more. That's where God comes into the equation. As I said, every point in space contains information. Virtual mm -hmm. particles that are popping in and out of existence perpetually. We live in a cosmic superconductor. Of course, I know that. The hydrogen collider has, pro has proved that. We live in a cosmic superconductor. There's an invisible field everywhere in the universe. There's an invisible field everywhere in the universe. We live in a cosmic superconductor. Every point in space contains information. Space is not empty. In fact, there's no such thing as nothing. Even nothing is something. There's no such thing as nothing. Even nothing is something. So every single point in space contains information. We know that there's an invisible field everywhere in the universe. And this invisible field is, is actually responsible for all of reality. Because all of reality can be described by quantum mechanics. But this doesn't disprove God's existence. God placed the quantum world into being. He placed the classical world into being. He operates through the, the laws of quantum mechanics. So, yes, everything is made up of quantum mechanics. Everything is made up of quantum mechanics. Everything is to do with subatomic particles, strings of light that oscillate. Everything in the universe oscillates. Strings of light that oscillate. We live in a quantum world. Everything is based on quantum mechanics. The universe is a cosmic superconductor, virtual particles that pop in, in and out of existence perpetually. As I said, this can't happen in our world, a classical world, because it violates the laws of energy. You can't produce mass where you didn't have mass in the first place. So this is reserved for the quantum world. So all of reality can be described by this invisible field. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. God placed that invisible field. He created that invisible field. God is the God of quantum mechanics. He created that particle. And that particle represents all of reality because all of reality is explained in quantum mechanics. In fact, uh, if, if, you if you amplify frequency, you change the structure of matter. Mm -hmm. 
Everything is based on quantum mechanics. All of reality is based on quantum mechanics. But that doesn't disprove God's existence. God is the God of quantum mechanics. He operates through quantum mechanics. He operates through quantum mechanics, which is why I said to you before, you know, an atheist will say that uh, with the laws of quantum mechanics combined to gravity itself, then space itself becomes a quantum mechanical variable, literally fluctuating in and out, in and out of existence. And you can, by the laws of quantum mechanics alone, create universes, spaces and times where there was no space and time before. But that's impossible because you still need a mechanism because physical realities do not come into being as a result of laws. Laws only describe how things work under certain conditions. They cannot create physical realities, which is why physical laws are one thing, agency is another, God is the creator of those laws and the universe operates under certain laws in quantum physics. Mm. I challenge Dawkins, I challenge the very best. Nobody will beat me in this, I can guarantee you. <laughs> okay, uh, brilliant. I just want to go with the audience uh, response as Please well do. as I will Please ask the question. Uh, uh, Gary Pop, he said, I'm very proud to know uh, Anthony. Uh, oh, Gary, 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 Gary is actually, <laughs> Please finish and then I'll, I'll uh, go ahead. Okay. Humara Tanzila, she said, informative session. Thank you, sir. Ayaz Ahmed, nice and really informative discussions. Ankit, uh, uh, he's from India and IBM TV. He said, hi, Sharifuddin Ahmed Rana and Anthony. What's chemistry behind biological economist? Uh, and uh, G. Saroj. Uh, right, he let, also let, 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 me, let me stop you there. Sorry, I thought that you were going to give me a bit more information on Gary's message. Let me mention yes. the Gary part. Sorry, Gary's actually my my best friend and a dear brother. So hello, Gary. Gary okay. is a uh, is a is actually a, a musician, and aside from being a musician, he's actually the guy that is behind all my artwork. He's he's the artist behind all the book covers. So Very he's good. brilliant. So yeah, so a big hello to Gary. Uh, Gary, as I said, is is a brilliant artist, and uh, we're we're brothers. And so there you go. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, uh, there are many good responses. Specifically, Ankit has questions. What chemistry behind biological economy? I'm sorry. He asked, "What chemistry behind biological economy?" What chemistry behind biological economy? Yes, that's a half. Like, that's a half baked okay. question. So, okay, no problem. Mr. Ankit, if you have a specific question, you can ask again. He will give you answer. Okay, I have a specific question. Well, because well, look, let, 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 me, let me mention this. Let me mention this because, sorry, whoever's asked that question has, has formulated the question in such, a, in such a manner that it's sort of half-baked in the sense that, as I mentioned, whether you go into biology, chemistry, physics, quantum mechanics, as I have mentioned extensively, reality, metaphysics, and so forth, because I'm a universal mind. I, I touch on every dimension of philosophy and, and science. When you look at biology and chemistry, as I said, going back to that transition in evolution, where I told you that we go, we transition from physics to biological processes, and then we have that sudden quantum leap into chemical processes. You remember I told you earlier, we have this sudden transition in evolution in the sense that we go from biology to chemistry. As a result of this transition from biology to chemistry, we have the formation of genetics, the high-tech genetic molecule, and then DNA and so forth, and then all life, yeah? No atheistic evolutionist, including Richard Dawkins, has been able to explain how this transition has occurred. They can explain vast amounts regarding evolution. I told you, our planet's about four and a half billion years old. After about half a billion years, we had microorganisms and bacteria. And then from then, things became far more complex over time and a lot larger and so forth. And then the whole evolution process began. But what I'm saying is this. Nobody can, no atheistic evolutionist can just understand how we had this sudden transition from biological processes to chemical processes. As a result, we had the formation of genetics, the high-tech genetic molecule. From there, we had DNA and so forth. And then the whole evolutionary process commences. What I'm saying is with this gap, this is not a gap. This is a, this is a, a colossal gap in the sense that if you can't explain how genetics started, you can't explain evolution. Because all of evolution sits on the pillar of genetics. 
All evolution sits on genetics. They can't understand. No, Dawkins does not understand how genetics started. But I do, in the sense that the only thing that have, could have kick-started genetics is an eternal spark that transcends time and space, that exists beyond time and space. As I said, time and space is an electromagnetic field, zero-point electromagnetic quanta. It's an electromagnetic field. God dwells in eternality. He's the spark that created genetics. He's that gap that they call a gap, that sparked genetics, thus evolution, thus life. He's that spark behind the mechanical universe. He's that spark behind evolution. He's that spark behind the atom, which I had mentioned earlier, behind the atom that lacks an electron, the abnormal, unstable atom that lacks an electron. All life starts as a result of an imperfection at an atomic level. The atom that lacks an electron seeks to merge with other atoms, forming covalent bonds, RNA, DNA, and the whole process of life starts as a result of an atomic deficiency. Order out of chaos. God works, operates. Through chaos, he establishes order, as I have mentioned. The, the, the stable atom with eight electrons, the stable, the stable atom with eight electrons doesn't do anything. It's, in quotes, perfect, but doesn't do anything. It's the abnormal, unstable atom that creates life. As I mentioned to you before, this is... Uh, a perfect example to say that the whole notion, the whole notion of perfection is nothing but a construct of the mind. It doesn't exist. It's a construct of the mind. The abnormal atom creates life. Perfection is a construct of the mind. So mentioning back to what I had discussed earlier with you, this and obviously the whole notion of uh, the chemical, shall we say, the biological transition from biology to chemistry and the formation of genetics and so forth. Okay, brilliant. Uh, I have a specific questions for my audience. Like, we, we know very small amount of things about the black hole and the process. With your meta metaphysics idea and everything, can you explain the black hole issues and uh, how well, actually... I mean, I mean, I mean, now, now, yeah, well, I mean, as I told you, I mean, black holes occur as a result of stellar death. As a star loses energy, succumbs to gravitational collapse, because a, a star essentially resists gravitational collapse all its life. As its elements grow heavier, the second law of thermodynamics is at work, the immutable metaphysical law of the universe, death. As I said, there is death within the cosmos. So basically, the immutable metaphysical law of the universe, entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, is at work within the cosmos. As we see a star eventually succumbs to gravitational collapse. It resists gravitational collapse all its life. As it succumbs to entropy, it loses energy, and it distorts the fabric of time and space in the formation of a black hole, singularity, and so forth. And then, of course, we have the whole thing of supernova, neutron star, and all the rest. But I think we're sort of degravitating away from the issue here a little bit, but I'm pretty happy to discuss these matters as, as well. So no problem. There you go. Okay. Okay, uh, at present, uh, let's say we have a competition in between machine and human. So, uh, so we are developing artificial intelligence as well as we are humans. There are many more challenging uh, issues right now. So my question is that, like, how you explain these competitions, the competition in between machines and human, how we can analyze the AI and beautiful little things inside AIs, and how we connect the dots in between humans and machine. Okay, well, I'll start with this. I'll start with this. Um, I write a lot about uh, androids and, uh, and, and uh, robots uh, extensively. In fact, my last book, Androids and the Gods, was all to do with androids, robots, and robotics, and so forth. And uh, I go from the very beginning and I expand my work to the point of where I told you I wrote about androids and the gods. Do androids stream of the gods? If an android can develop a sense of God within itself, then we have to redefine metaphysics. We have to redefine the nature of the mind, the nature of God and so forth, which is a colossal philosophical concept. But I mean, in short, I write extensively about AI in terms of robots, androids, um, for example, how do you give a machine a goal? It needs a description of a future situation. 
How do you give a machine an active goal, which is very different? It needs a description of a future situation, a present situation, and then a process that thus needs to make them the same to change the present situation. So I go into the philosophy of AI as well. Um, I speak extensively about uh, robotics. In my last book, as I said, I intercombine theology. I intercombine theology with, with robotics. That is my essential key here. I, how can I say this? I actually go beyond. I mean, we have science fiction books that deal with robotics doing the basic tasks that we expect robots to do. But I take a robot and it actually has the capacity to interconnect with God, to develop a sense of God, which is why I said I take metaphysics and robotics to another level with all due respect to other science fiction writers. I've taken it to another dimension. We have the, 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 the four law of robotics, which are fantastic. I've created my own law of robotics um, in my new book. An android will be programmed to acknowledge the one world government. Sorry, an android will be programmed to acknowledge the one world government as its only God, the first law of robotics. I mean, I could go into that, but we'll save that for another day because there's a lot to do with this particular topic. So I connect AI with theology and metaphysics. So if a machine can develop in itself a sense of God and understanding that God exists, then we need to redefine metaphysics. We need to define the nature of man, the nature of the mind, and the universe, God, and so forth. So I take robotics to another dimension altogether. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So, uh, so, yes. so, thank you. Yes, thank you. Can we extend it a few minutes because uh, uh, I have one hour of time for you. You can extend as much as you like. No problem. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. So, okay. Uh, at present situations, we have a lot of tensions and we have a lot of uh, issues uh, in between believers and non-believers, as well as uh, we are. Uh, yeah. We, we, we are facing a tremendous economical challenges. Do you have any solutions at present right now? Do you find any, any things in your mind or in your ideology, how we can overcome from these situations? What you thought, what you believe, how we can uh, uh, make this world better? How do I believe we can make this world better? Yes, like example, what's your thoughts? How so are you can breaking you... up? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Sorry, you, you were breaking you were breaking up a little bit. Okay. How we My... can make the world better. Yes, how we can make better uh, make this world better. And most importantly, how we can overcome from present situations, like in pandemic situations. Do you do you have any specific thoughts? Well, in terms in terms of making the world better, I think that all comes to do with the moral philosophy mm -hmm. and understanding that there is a greater being beyond time and space and that in fact our morality is etched into laws that god has given us and this is the anthropological argument the anthropological argument is that within our soul we have an understanding of what is right and wrong so i think really to make the world a better place is to have higher moral values and to hold on to those higher moral values, which have been inscribed within our soul. As I said, our soul is a nexus of electromagnetic forces. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. It's a nexus of electromagnetic forces that cannot be destroyed, as I said, for the, the first law of thermodynamics will suggest that. So our soul, our being, has to be morally receptive and understanding rights and wrong. So ethics, morality, and having and being very sensitive to things of this nature, I think you have a better world. Okay, very interesting. I want uh, uh, this is my last question from your pers perspective for believers and non-believers. What's the best advice from from your side? How we can do more research on that? How university educations can more involve? with that particular points like uh, and do more research on that particular points on believers and non-believers what's the what the issue how we can solve these things and how we can create more logical society 
Are you, so basically what you're saying in essence, how can we bring atheists to really understand that there is actually something that transcends time and space, that there is a greater reality beyond this three-dimensional space? Is that what you're asking me in essence? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Well, I would say the only way you can do that is to do what I'm doing. <laughs> The only way you can actually get atheists to think is to have people like me on your show, uh, writing the books that I write and challenging their arguments. As I said, I'm willing to challenge the very best. Dawkins, whoever it may be, the very best I'll challenge, no problem. Because I know that my arguments are too strong, too tight. When you really analyze science, when you, as I told you, I'm gonna go back now to the very beginning of our discussion. When you look at the neutron, as I told you, Man is made up of many particles, many particles, but the particle that we're made up of mostly is a neutron. It's radioactive and it decays within 10 minutes. So how do we exist? As I explained, when a neutron decays, it decays into three particles, proton, uh, neutrino, and uh, proton, neutrino, and electron, yeah? I mentioned that. So you have the first law of thermodynamics. Then when also mentioned the fact that it's known as weak decay, Within the world of particle physics, it's known as weak decay because it takes so long to decay, right? But in the classical world, this is a very short period of time. So you have the relativity of time. So going back to my point, why, why is it that we exist if we're made up of something that is radioactive yeah, and decays so quickly within 10 minutes? Well, I told you this incredible order out of chaos. Once you place a neutron into a nucleus, it becomes bound. Once it becomes bound, it loses energy. Now we apply the, fo the, the formula of relativity, E equals mc squared. We know that if it loses energy, it will lose mass. It loses so much mass, it stabilizes within the nucleus and it doesn't decay. And that's why we exist. As I said, this is not an accident. It's far too complex. This is orchestrated by a higher power. This is not an accident. Impossible, mathematically impossible. <laughs> Okay, this is very nice discussion for uh, for World Talent Economy Forums and futures. We want to arrange different kind of debate, and I know you are a professional debater. So you attend in Oxford and the Cambridge and the. Oxford well, I haven't actually debated at Oxford. I've, I've, uh, I've challenged the atheistic society here in London many mm -hmm. times. Chris Street, who is behind Richard Dawkins, sort of, uh, should we say, society and so forth. So I've tried to initiate a debate i'm still waiting for that debate and i can't wait i hope it does happen but yes, um, sure. but uh, i have been on on television revelation tv six years ago as i said i'm a philosopher an author of six books quantum chronicles one and two imperial planets silent earth the mars time project which is, which is all about mars a completely different world altogether and my last book androids and the gods and now i've started a new project called uh, beyond earth's horizon which is about parallel dimensions so I'm very multidimensional. Um, as I said, uh, people ask me, you know, what do you write about? The truth of the matter is I'm a polymath. I write about everything, science, philosophy, theology, space, just an explosion of everything, really. And uh, that basically summarizes me and my work. And I look forward to uh, being on your show in the future and debating some atheists. Please yes. let me know when. Yes, definitely. We will arrange a lot of debate and uh, uh, we will invite you. And hopefully by this way, with the debating, with scientific arguments, uh, with scientific dialogues, we will make a meaningful contributions and we will build a better society. And uh, uh, here, uh, we try to give opportunity all of the brilliant people in One Talent, One Talent Economy Forums. And hopefully we will achieve our goal with the brilliant effort and with the best effort people like you those you you contribute your knowledge those who contribute with your analysis we i will can find out the solution i will some i will just conclude with this by the way yeah all all the knowledge in the world you could have all the knowledge in the world okay but if you don't have that connection with the eternal being it means nothing you mm -hmm. can build a computer a supercomputer which i write about in my books in, in terms of AI and robotics, mechanical brainwave. You can have a computer that can have all the answers to life. But if that isn't connected with the eternal source, it collapses. Epistemology, which in philosophy is to do with knowledge, if you do not connect all that knowledge that has been given to you from the eternal source, because all knowledge comes from the eternal source that transcends time and space, all knowledge. Otherwise, how do you explain knowledge? 
It all comes mm -hmm. from the eternal source. If you remove God from the equation, knowledge collapses, everything collapses. Morality, everything. You have chaos. So after all I have said in terms of my, my, my explanation, I've gone into science, philosophy, theology. I've touched on many areas. I've tried to condense a lot into a very tight space. And so it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. But at the end of the day, if that isn't connected to theology, science and philosophy mean nothing. It hovers hopelessly in space with no connection. It doesn't mean anything. Science and philosophy needs to be connected to God. Otherwise, it's meaningless. I end on that note, my friend. Yes, uh, this is very interesting discussions. So definitely we will connect with science, philosophy, as well as we will connect with God. And by this way, we will create better community. So anybody has better argument? Anybody want to do a debate with Mr. Anthony? I think he's ready. And we I'm, can arrange. I'm, I'm, willing, I'm willing in an hour's time. No problem. Let me know. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. Anytime, okay. even midnight. Okay. On okay. that note, I just want to say a big thank you to yourself and to my friend Gary Pope, who who's watching this. As I said, Gary's a dear friend, he's a dear brother, he's a fantastic uh, musician, and uh, and all my artwork has been done by Gary. So a big hello to Gary, and uh, thank you for watching, Gary. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and thank you for your passions. So definitely, we're going to invite you future for uh, classical debate. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. When you get the, when you when you get the the atheist, make sure you get the very best. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your advice. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yes.